Okay, maybe we need to go over this one more time. Do we have to? Well, sweetie, I don't know if you're getting a good grasp of the ratios here. Fine. Okay, all right, well, step by step. Before we spend any money, what's the first thing that we do? Give to God. Good, and why do we do that? Because he first loved and gave to us. Good, 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 good. Okay, great. Now the second jar here is for so many different things. Hold on. What? God lives in heaven, right? Yeah, he lives in heaven. And heaven has streets paved with gold, right? Streets paved with gold, sure, yes. So why does he need my money if I don't even have a job? <laughs> okay, all right, so good question. So basically when we give to God, we're, we're giving to the church. So the church gives the money to God? No, the church keeps the money. Oh, does God know about this? <laughs> yes, he uh, basically built the system, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. See, sweetie, as you grow up, there is nothing better than giving back to God. In the Bible, it's the only place God says, test me on this. When it comes to your money, he says, test me. It's almost like he's saying, I dare you. And your mom and I, we do just that. Even when things are tough, we always give the first part of our money back to God. And then the church takes that money and does all kinds of things to make God famous, uh, like camps and mission trips and even VBS that you love so much, and even helps out people that are in need. You can't outgive God. And when God says test him and you do it, he will come through every single time. Okay, Dad, I get it. I do have one question, though. Oh, okay. Why do we need to test God if he already knows all the answers? That's, that's good. Let me just retrace my steps here just for a minute. <sighs> Well, that was not necessarily connected with the parking lot, but it's connected with the parking lot anyway. Um, you know, trying to explain that to little kids is not always easy. But I find that saying that to adults also sometimes is not very easy. I, I want you to know one thing, and I've heard this from people that come to Grace Bible Church. The issue is the tithe. You know what a tithe is? A tithe is one-tenth of your gross earnings. So if your gross earnings in a check is like $2,000, according to the tithe, that's 10%, is $200. If you were living back in the time of Moses and time of the Old Testament Jews, they were to give 10% of their gross. They didn't have a choice if they were following God, if they loved the Lord, if they were going to be obedient to what he said. The tithe is not for today, okay? I'll repeat that so that you really understand. Tithing your income, 10% of the gross, is not for today. How does God want us to be tested? The testing comes is that he wants us to look at our finances. And the first thing you do is take what you believe to be a weekly or monthly gift to God. 
give to the church, give to other mission organizations, whatever. But that's something you have to make a choice about. You have to decide in your heart. The test comes is when at the beginning of the year, like my wife and I do, we sit down and we say, this is what we're going to be giving. That when tough times come, unexpected bills, unexpected things come in our life, how do we deal with that? One of the things that has to happen when that kind of thing happens in your life, in your family's life, is don't cut it off the top. You know, let something else go if it has to. I remember when we were really hurting, and I use the word financially hurting, when we were younger and we were tested. I mean, we were really tested. And I remember the times that we've had hardly anything to live on, and yet we wrote the check out that we had promised at the beginning of the year, throughout the year, and God provided for our needs along the way. You see, what's really being tested is our faith. Our faith to give what we had promised in the beginning of the year and to do that on a regular basis and not be concerned about the rest of the finances. God takes care of the rest of the finances. I know that may be difficult for you to understand and grasp, but I want you to know it really works. So don't be concerned about tithing. I'll challenge you with this. Give more than 10% of your gross income to the Lord. It's really a way to be testing yourself in your faith. My wife and I have done that for many years, decades, and God's always provided above and beyond in our life. I know the church is not about money, and this church is not about your money. This church is about Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And we're trusting God to do the will of God in the financial area as well. So pray and give as God delights. And remember this, God loves a cheerful giver. When you give, don't give because you have to give. Give because you want to give. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving everything through your Son, Jesus Christ. And he gave himself. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. Father, we are recipients of that gift to this world. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you this morning. We want to give to you worship. We want to give you thanks. We want to give of ourselves and worship to you because we love you. So take our time of worship and glorify yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and let's worship him.
may be seated. Has God ever failed you yet? Forever, God is faithful. Have you ever failed God? See, God is faithful. Let's trust him. Thank you for being here. We're going to give an offering to the Lord and trust that God would be glorified through it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us so much. And thank you for your faithfulness throughout our entire lives. Thank you for food and clothing. Thank you for shelter. Thank you for vehicles. Thank you for so much that you have provided for us. Father, we give back to you a portion of what we've received. And may you be exalted and glorified. We pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. reading this morning our scripture this is my privilege to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 10 through 15 in 9 just to give us a little start it says for we are God's fellow workers you are God's field God's building in 10 according to the grace of God given to me this is Paul speaking. Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day, with a capital D there. We'll disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved but only as through fire. And I see a, quite a few gentlemen out here, and I'm sure some ladies, that have built something. It may not have been a building. It might have been a cake, 
A cake has to have a good foundation for it to hold the frosting, if you will, and a foundation needs to be solid to build a building. Without that solid foundation, it will crumble, it will lean, it will fall over. So is our lives. If we do not build our lives on Christ's foundation, what he has built for us, we will fail. And of course, it here it says that our work will be burned up. So only the good things that are done through Christ, for Christ, will stand in the final day, the capital D. Would you all stand with us as we sing before the throne of God?
Hallelujah means praise the Lord. Let's praise him right now. Father, we thank you. We exalt you. We magnify you. For you have done so very much for us. Father, we thank you that we stand before you blameless, holy, in perfection, in Christ. We thank you that he came that we might live forever. We thank you that he came to forgive us of all of our sins. And Lord, we rejoice in the privilege of knowing him and knowing you. Father, may the word of God speak to hearts this morning. May the Holy Spirit guide me as I preach and those that hear. And may you be magnified by it. We love you, Father, and thank you so much for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Those in junior church may be excused. Go downstairs. I want you to look for and find the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be looking at that, but uh, also looking at Luke chapter 3. John, the preacher of righteousness. The Line of Fire had an article in this particular book. How compromise preaching in contributing to our cultural rot. Interesting title. This was a Dr. Michael Brown has a article out of Torchbearers. What he is talking about, the fact of pastors, congregations, that the pulpit has influence in our culture today. He is going to be quoting here, and I'm going to quote that particular portion. In 1873, Charles Finney preached. And here are some of the words that he shared. I better get this up here so you can see it. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, if the church is degenerate and worldly, if the world loses its interest in religion, if Satan rules in our halls of legislation, if our politics become so corrupt that they are very, the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away. He then says, the pulpit is responsible for it. You know what he's saying? He's pointing his finger at me. Why is he pointing his finger at a pastor the person that's in the pulpit. Well, let me give you some insight. Statistics from New Barna study. 37% of Christian pastors in the United States of America have a biblical worldview. What's a biblical worldview? They take and they preach this book. They preach the essence of this book, the gospel of this book, and they don't get up and tell stories and fairy stories and things like that. They get up and they proclaim it. But they have a biblical worldview. They look at the world through the scriptures, and they see it that way. 63% of pastors, Christian evangelical pastors, do not have a biblical worldview 
worldview. But it gets worse. 4% of executive pastors, an executive pastor is a pastor of a mega church, a big church that has an assistant pastor, a youth pastor, a worship pastor, and other pastors as part of the staff, and then they have a board. Only 4% have a biblical worldview. So the churches that are big, 96% of the pastors do not have a biblical worldview. But get the last one. 2% of parents of preteens held a biblical view of the world. 2%. You know, talk about fighting and going uphill. Talk about the struggles that we're working through. And we have some parents in our congregation here that have a biblical world view. And I'm thankful for that. In fact, all preteen parents should have a biblical view. I mean, things are tough. People are going through difficult times in our world today. But our kids and grandkids are going to struggle. It's going to get worse before it gets better. So understand exactly where all this takes place. America needs revival. The preacher is the one that causes much of that and can be an important part of that. And therefore, we must preach the word of God. We must preach what it says. We must preach from the Bible and not just give stories or tickle people's ears. We need to be interested in God-approved messages. We need to be interested in striving to please God, not to please man. We need to forget about numbers in the pews, in chairs. We need to forget about money. Because those are the two factors that many pastors are always concerned about. And by the way, when we went through the pandemic that we've had the last four years, many of the big churches were the ones that fell apart and struggled and had to take loans out in order to continue on. And it was because they didn't have a biblical worldview. I want to go back to Ezekiel, and I hope you found that in your Bibles. I'm going to read a a long portion here, so hang on to your hats. He's writing through Ezekiel, and we're going to start with verse 24, but I want to start with 23 with just a few words. And the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel. Son of man, say to her, who is the her? Israel. It's a nation. Supposed to be a godly nation. Listen to what is said. You are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Now we just talked here in this particular area of the prophets. These are the prophets. They're the ones that need to come along and express and preach the word of God. This is what they did. Verse 26 is the priests those that were supposed to be religious and godly. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the clean and the unclean. And they have disregarded my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. The priests... We're supposed to be the ones. They're they're really probably the pastors. 
And they're the ones that were supposed to be taking and making sure that the Israelites were doing exactly what they needed to be doing according to God's way and according to God's word. But they didn't do it. They blended the world, they blended everything together with their religion. And God was not pleased. Verse 27. Here are the princes or the leaders of the country. And in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord, when the Lord never spoke to them in the beginning. This is what's happening in our nation. I mean, if there's a, a, a good list here, this is it. Verse 29 says, And the people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have opposed, oh, excuse me, oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted the sojourner without justice. So this is the state of Israel right now, as Ezekiel writes. This is a sad predicament. The people of God should have been shining and should have been a light to the world. Instead, they were blending in with the world, trying to be just like the world. And their young people and the old people and the priests and the princes and the prophets all were in the same boat. You see, it was the leadership that took and allowed the people to live the way they wanted and so the indictment comes towards me. It comes towards us as pastors. We can get up here and tickle your ears, but to no good at all. Look at what's next. Verse 30. And I sought for a man. Notice, I sought for a man, some one man. Among them who should build up the wall, stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. He's looking, looking throughout all Jerusalem, looking for all of Israel, looking for a man. Notice the end of that. But I found none. Didn't find one man. What a sad predicament for the nation of Israel. Hundreds of thousands of people, and not one man. Verse 31. Therefore I will pour out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have turned, returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord. That's what's going to happen to Israel. And you know that it did because God's word is complete. Understand that God doesn't mess around. And when we come to this point in this message, we're going to be faced with a man by the name of John the Baptist and what happens with him. We're going to be turning over to Luke in just a moment. John issued two proclamations about the need for the Jews to show their genuine repentance. And the reason for it is because the Jews at, in John's age, in Jesus' age, in Paul's age, were corrupt. The leadership was horrible. And you're going to find as we walk through the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus had to reprove, rebuke, and he said some strong things as he walked along. John the Baptist is coming before him, and we've already talked about that. He was the one that was to prepare the way. He's the one that wants to take and, and make things right. But he's fighting a whole nation of people that are reprobates, that are sinning, that are doing their own things. This message is for America. This message is for those that need to understand 
That our God is not just sitting back and enjoying himself and watching America go down the tubes morally and spiritually. And he sees many Christians that are going in the same direction because they have chosen to simply avoid God. Regretfully, they just pushed him aside and they're living their own lives for themselves. That happens to many, many people even believers in Jesus Christ. So let's look at those two proclamations. The first one we find in the book of Luke is the need to bear fruit. God is looking at people's lives. He's looking at your life, he's looking at my life, and he's deciding as you live out your life whether you are bearing fruit to the glory of God or whether you're just living for yourself and whatever you can get out of life. You see, we're no different in America than where John was in his day and age. The need to bear spiritual fruit for the Lord. Let's look at verse 7. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, John, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? He's talking to the people. Not talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the big leaders. He's talking to the average person. He says, you brood of vipers, understand the baptism that he's talking about here, and they were coming to be baptized by him, was a picture of washing, a picture of purification, a picture of making their lives right before God. It did not forgive sin. The water itself had nothing to do with it. It was their hearts that needed to come to God in honest, genuine faith to believe who he was, but not only to the fact, but they wanted to follow God's ways. So when they listened to John's ministry and his preaching, they responded. Some did. As we know, not the majority. Just some of them did. That they came and were baptized because they saw the reason for it. They saw the purpose of it, that it's a washing and purification that the Jews needed for a sign. But he notices here, you brood of vipers. I looked at that and I said, brood of vipers. What's a better word? The better word is offspring. People that are born. New people that have come into the world. And he says, what you're doing is you're doing the same thing with your life. And you're expecting your kids to do the very same thing you're doing. You're a brood of vipers, snakes, poisonous snakes. And he says, you're raising a bunch of poisonous snakes. How's that, huh? That's pretty heavy. I don't know if you were in the crowd, if you were there. Would you stand up and say, well, it's okay, John. You're right. Not too many people would have agreed with John. But John was proclaiming what God wanted him to proclaim. It says, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? You see, what Ezekiel said back there is applicable right here. Hundreds of years before, who's going to escape when the wrath of God comes upon you? Who's going to escape from it? And that's where our world is today. I don't know how you see it, but our world is in a terrible mess. And this message is fit for our world. But then he speaks to the hearts of the people and wants them to come to repentance. They want them to come to a change in their lives. And you know, We all need to make changes. There are some small and some insignificant, but there are some areas of our life that we need to really take and clean it up and wipe it out. 
Then he says in verse 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself, we are Abraham's, uh, Abraham as of our, our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. So he starts out by saying, you need to bear fruit. And that Greek word up there, poeo, is really the word. But you're going to see it over and over again. It's an imperative. It's a command. And so John is commanding them, bear fruit. I command you, bear fruit. In order that you may be able to keep this whole process going for God. In keeping with repentance. You see, a lot of people will repent. A lot of people will come to the front of a church in a service. A lot of people raise their hand in a service. A lot of people will confess and say, you know, I really need to change my life. But he's talking here about bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance is important. And what is repentance? It's a change of an attitude. It's a change of mind. But I declare to you this morning, it is a change of life. It's a change of living. It's a change of the way we behave and act and act out our Christianity in this world. It's a change in which God becomes first, not last. It's a change that the word of God is important to you and you read it and study it and try to understand it to know the will of God for your life. That's the change of attitude. And it's so easy to say it. Well, I'm sorry, God, I, I'm sorry I'm dead wrong. But there's no fruit. There's no change of life. And it says here, bear fruits in keeping. Keeping meaning deserving, fitting. That when you see my work in my life after I've repented and you see the fruit, that it's in fitting to you, God. Not that everybody else recognizes you, pats you on the back, says, oh, good job, good job. No, no, no. It's talking about God saying, good job. You're a good person, a good Christian. And so, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. But look at the next one. It says, and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. Don't think that you are a spiritual person. Just because you've been born in the line of Abraham, just because you're a Jew and just because God has chosen the Jewish people as his people, don't just walk around and say, well, I'm born of Abraham's seed and that's good enough for me. And that's what John is saying. And he was speaking to whom? Speaking to Jews. Speaking to the very people regarding this very issue. And says, we have Abraham as a father. Don't tell me about it. It's not important to me. Really what John is saying. He says, this is what God is saying. For I tell you, God is able to take these stones and raise them up for children for Abraham. You know, you look at that and say, what, what is he saying? He's saying exactly what he said. God could take up a bunch of rocks and make them into the children of Abraham. Do you know what? We're Gentiles here this morning. We're the rocks. Thousands of years later, but we're the rocks. God has taken the Gentiles who were not God's people and made them become God's people. You became a child of God, not because you were a Jew and not because you were of Abraham's seed. We are only of Abraham's seed because we have the same kind of faith in Jehovah God as Abraham did, and we have our faith in Jesus Christ. And we become child of God. A child 
that God loves and cares about and nourishes and is concerned about. We can change the world. Not that we would go out and proclaim. It's the fact that we become shining lights in the midst of a world that is dark and black and bleak. And if your light is not shining for Jesus Christ, by the way your attitude is from your brain, the way that your words come out of your mouth, the way that you act in this world, you need to repent. Simple as that. You may come here every Sunday and listen to me preach, and I'll proclaim the word of God, and I will preach the word of God. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. I'm going to preach and proclaim what God has given to me. Notice what he says here. Even now, Verse 9, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Hmm. Pretty harsh. Pretty strong. So the axe, and I can figure that one out. Axes do a good job cutting down trees and limbs. And the axe has to be sharp. This is laid and placed at the root. Not placed on the side of the tree in order to fall the tree. It's placed at the root to kill the tree. He's talking about individuals, lives that are dead. And notice what he says here. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit, good fruit, acceptable, fine fruit that God is pleased with, is thrown, sudden force of, tossed into the fire, into the pure, P-U-R, a Greek word which means a heap of burning material, a bonfire, a place where we put paper, cardboard, sticks, branches, and wood to burn. Even now, the axe is laid. Even now, the root of the tree is ready to be chopped and sliced. So there's no sustenance going to the tree. And the tree dies. You know, Jesus did that within 24 hours of a tree, the fig tree, remember, and wiped it out. George Anderson was from a small town in Oklahoma. He made a story for the newspapers, but it wasn't the fact that he was converted, the, the fact that he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior and became a Christian. But it was a part of his life and the change that came into the community. For he went to the police department and he confessed a sin that he had participated in a bank robbery years and years ago. In fact, it was 20 years ago. And the statute of limitations means that they, they could not prosecute him because it was so long, far away from the incident. And so what George did was two things. Number one, he confessed his crime to the law officers. And the second thing he did was he repaid his share of all that money that he stole. That was his repentance. That was what he did voluntarily. And there are things in our life that we need to do in the presence of God, not for publicity, but God has forgiven us of all of our sins in the past. Every one of them has been forgiven. And when we sin today, when we do things or say things or think things that are wrong in God's sight, we need to say, I'm sorry. That's confession. You don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell anybody else. You and God, that's where the communication needs to be coming out. 
is a danger of quenching the spirit and grieving the spirit comes if you don't say I'm sorry. If you think you're right all the time, you, you need to be very, very careful about that. You know, we have sin in our life and we sin in thought, word, in deed. Sometimes it's just an attitude or a motivation. And when it's all said and done, we need to be saying, thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. I know you will notice one thing in this list up here on the screen. Very carefully. There is no need to beg God for forgiveness. Because it's already happened. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has what? Cleansed you of all your sin. And the blood of Jesus Christ is going to continue to cleanse your sin as a Christian the rest of your life. The issue is we need to get right with God. And that's what this repentance is all about in our lives. No matter how small or how large the sin may be in our lives. Well, let's look at the second proclamation that comes in verses 10 following. The specific ways to show repentance. And what happened was there were men that would come up or, or people that would come up to John and says, what do I have to do? You know, sometimes it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, but uh, sometimes they just don't have the ability to understand what does God want in my life. And you may be in that same boat. You say, well, what does God really want from me? So maybe you can identify with some of these here. The average Jew, and this is verses 10 and 11. The crowds asked him, what then should we do? He answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. You'll see the word up there, poiao, work. That's what you should do. That's what you should do. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will do it. And so he's talking here about tunics, the outer part of our garments, of any kind of clothing that we have and, and give to the poor. And, you know, we don't live in a real poor district of Milwaukee land, but there are people that walk around and, and are needing food, clothing. And this is what he is saying. I command you. I want you to do this. This is an imperative. And this is not a request of saying, well, maybe if you got time or if you got the money or if you can possibly do it, do it. If you find someone that is in need, do it. And I want to say thank you again for those of you that were involved in the funeral this last Friday. How that you came to the plate and within a short time able to provide the food for the uh, Wanta family. And... Uh, I just thank God for you and how much God has ministered through you uh, through that time. Verse 12 is talking about tax collectors. Verse 12 says, tax collectors also came to be him to be baptized and says, teacher, what shall we do? You, you need to understand they're asking the question before they get water baptized. But they've come to him and said, you know, I'd like to be water baptized. I want to be purified. I want to be cleansed. I want to be washed. But what, we, what do we need to do? And the tax collectors were told by John, and he said to them in verse 13, collect no more than you are authorized to do. You know, you, you've been uh, given a job. You would carry out the job. In this particular case, collecting money for taxes. He says, do your job. Perform that job. But then he says, make sure you don't take any more, don't ask any more, don't, uh, collect any more than what you've been authorized to collect. Only what's been given orders for you to collect, only collect that much money. I'm sure that I've never been a tax collector, so I don't know about it, but I'm sure there must be a temptation to want to collect a little more, put it in my pocket rather than the government's pocket. But that's what they were supposed to do. So they had to make a choice. Are we willing to take and only collect what we're supposed to? 
and then be water baptized. So that's the way it worked out there. Then some soldiers came up in verse 14 and also asked him, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be content with your wages. I would say probably that the soldiers weren't really highly paid. And so there was this whole process. And I'm sure they watched their senior officers uh, come and, and extort money, which basically they, they took it by force or they threatened them and said, you don't give us more money, we're going to and give us a threat. And John says, this is what you do. You, you don't do it that way. You don't do it the way you've seen it or have seen it done. And again, notice what he says here at the end. Be content with your wages the way they are. Imperative means a what? A command. Oh, yeah, I was just wondering if you're awake there. A command. He commands them to be content. Is it easy to be content? Sometimes it's pretty tough, isn't it? But he's talking here about the issue of money. Be content with your wages. Well, that may be another thing that in the time of inflation right now, are you content with your wages? Because your money that you are getting today is not the same amount of money that you got six months ago. That's how the inflation is taken and eaten away at our dollars as we try to spend them wisely. So they were to be content with their wages. And then John's final warning, starting with verse 15. As the people were in expectation, all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. And it's interesting, this word for expectation is not looking forward with great anticipation. In fact, it's looking forward with apprehension. And you don't know what the word apprehension means. It means with anxiety, with fear, with worry, with concern of impending danger or trouble, which is an interesting response here. But the people were expecting. Why, why do you think they were worried? Why were they fearful and anxious? I mean, if the Christ was to come, wasn't it a good thing? The reason is because when Christ was to come, he was to come with an anger, with a fear that would come upon the people of this world. And in the Great Tribulation, that's exactly the way it was. They were concerned about Jesus Christ coming, but they saw the negative again. They saw what God was going to do through Jesus Christ when he did come. The anticipation was not for expectation, but for apprehension. Verse 16, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming in the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the issue here that we have is the baptism with water. And, of course, the issue is why, why is John doing the baptizing, pondering and wondering. But John is saying, I'm baptizing you with water for this time of purification and cleansing. But he says, there's somebody mightier than me, there's someone bigger than me that's coming along. I'm, he's coming after me, but he'll be here. And when he comes, you're going to have to face him. Really, it means that it's an implication that it's a process. And God gave that process in the Old Testament, that John would come, he would present Jesus Christ to them and, and say he's coming, and then later the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have his own ministry and, of course, and proclaim himself to the Jewish world. Then he says here, if you look at the end of the verse, it says here that uh, he who is mightier than I am coming the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire is a purification. Yes, destruction, but it's a purification. It's that way that Jesus is going to come. When Jesus 
leaves this earth in Acts chapter 1. And the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2. You find that he came with cloven fire on their heads. Again, the whole aspect of a sign for the Jews related to what John is talking about here. This matter of taking and being purifying, a cleansing, if you would have it. In verse 17, his winnowing fork is in his hand. A winnowing fork is in his hand. A fork that separates the chaff from the grain. And they have it on a, a large floor. And the wind would blow and they would take the fork and they would dig it into the wheat or the barley. They'd throw it up in the air. And the wind would come along and would blow away the chaff and the straw. And it would allow the grain to come on down. And they would do this for hour after hour. And Jesus Christ, the, the, the one that is yet to come, is going to come and separate the chaff from the grain. We're going to separate the saved from the unsaved, if we want to say it that way. Notice what it says here. He's going to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn. Going to take and gather the wheat and he's going to put it in the storehouse in order for it to be stored so that they can use it for, of course, food for the cattle. The, the chaff is really the husks of the grain. And I trust you understand that eating the husk doesn't give you anything. There's no nutrition in the husks. So you like to get to that soft part of the grain of a oat or wheat or barley. And then he says here, going to gather them into his barn. But notice what happens to the chaff. The chaff he will burn with the unquenchable fire. Two things that you look at. One would be the fact that, oh, he's going to burn it up. Going to take and burn all the believers, unbelievers up. And when they go into the lake of fire or hell, they're just going to be burned up. But notice what the next word says. Unquenchable. A fire that cannot be put out. The fire will continue to burn. That judgment by God is going to be permanent. You know, living through this life is not simply taking and living it out and enjoying it and, and going on from here. Living out this life that we have for the Lord is incredibly important. And to make decisions right now in your life and mine is truly important. I want to give you an illustration of what I think this is talking about. There's a city in Canada, Labrador, uh, Labrador and the name of the city is Wabush. In Wabush is an isolated town, which, you know, it was all by itself. People that lived in that town couldn't get out, couldn't go anyplace. And one day they decided to send and have a road constructed to this place called Wabush. And so they went through the woods, the forests, and whatever, and they moved timber, they, they cleared the way, and they finally uh, got a road all the way from a populated area to Wabush. If you took your car and you drove to Wabush, it would take you about six to eight hours. It's a long trip, not just a, a little dinky trip. The issue is that if you went to Wabush, the only way you could return is on the same road. And the issue that it brings to me is this, that repentance in our lives is the same way. We travel in a certain direction. And if we're traveling in a direction of sinning against God in our lives, the only way that we can be restored is to take and turn 180 degrees and start walking back towards God. And that's what we need to do. 
God wants us to be restored to him. He wants us to repent. And true be repentance includes our behaviors, our habits, our sinfulness, our evil thoughts, whatever they may be in our life. And God was, wants us to take and turn around and face him and walk back towards him and go back to him again. I want you to understand, this is what God wants in each one of our lives. As believers in Jesus Christ, that we would return and restore ourselves back to him. And with that, we should be bearing good fruit. We should be demonstrating our repentance towards God as we live our lives out for him. Your takeaway today, make the necessary changes to become godly. I don't know where you are in your life. You know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, take some time to evaluate and analyze where you are. And when you evaluate, be willing to surrender yourself to him. Be willing to say, I dedicate my body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto you, which is my reasonable worship of service. That's where God wants us. And every day you get up, commit your day to the Lord. Commit your walk to Christ. Allow him to fill you with holiness. And I don't know what he has for you for the rest of your life, but I know this, whatever he has is the best thing for you. Always giving you the very best every day. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? If you're here this morning, and I don't know your heart, don't know your life, if God has spoken to you about anything, I trust that you will take the time to talk to him about it. And if there are changes that need to be made in your life, that you will make them between you and God. Father, thank you so much that you are patient with us. You have given so much to us in our life. And sometimes you let us linger, you let us go astray. And yet you are constantly wanting us to come back. I pray, Father, that as we evaluate our hearts this morning, that you might allow us to walk closer and closer to you for your glory. Thank you for John. Thank you for his boldness to preach. And I pray that you might help our church, the people of this church, to follow your ways and that I as a pastor would continue to preach the truth rather than to butter it down or sweeten it up. May it be God's word to please you. Thank you for your message this morning. Prepare our hearts as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand, please, as we worship.
because our God is great. Let everyone give thanks. That the way you feel this morning? God's desire is that we would please him all the time. And I hope that something from the message may speak to your heart and cause you to turn closer to him today and that God would allow you to see the refreshing difference it will make in your life because it does make a difference. I trust you have a good week. It's a beautiful day out, sunny, cool. Enjoy it. God bless you.